Gary Parrish, welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds. Leaky Black, Matt Norlander, is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button. If you're Brandon Davies, you have consent. Don't forget to also subscribe to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel while you're here. All right, let's get into it. Nope. College basketball Tuesday night. Kansas beat Kentucky 89-84 in the second game of the Champions Classic. Yes, we'll get to the first in just a bit. Deadleg, you watched it. Deadleg, you wrote about it. Give me your impressions from KU's win over UK. Well, I wrote about Kentucky, but I'll acknowledge Kansas off the top here. Uh, a very entertaining game. Uh, really, you know, made up for Duke, Michigan State being just okay. And we'll get to that in just a, just a couple minutes here. Kansas ruled the paint as expected. You know, Kentucky didn't have it, it didn't have any kind of size to really match up with KU. Um, this was the sixth time in the past eight meetings the Jayhawks have come out on top versus the Wildcats. And Dickinson, I mean, twenty seven and twenty one, um, amazing, amazing performance there. He was the first Big Twelve player to go for at least twenty five and twenty against a ranked uh, foe since Blake Griffin did it back in two thousand eight. Uh, when Blake Griffin did it, he did it against Davidson when Davidson was ranked. I actually, weirdly enough, remember that game. Um, the first Kansas guy since to have a 25-20 game, by the way, since Thomas Robinson did it, uh, you know, 12 years ago. So a big time, big time stuff. Um, according to Kansas, there had not been uh, a player um, that had gone for 25 or more points and 20 or more rebounds, which, which Dickinson did. That had not happened for a Kansas player since at least 1996, 97, which is when a lot of these um, stat references, uh, Stats Inc. goes back to the 96, 97 season. So huge stuff. And yet Kevin McCullough had the third technical triple double of, of in Kansas history, joining Jeff Withy and Cole Aldrich. I'm pretty sure Wilt had a, a triple double or two, but blocks weren't an official assist or official stat back then. Um, but regardless, um, McCullough was like the third most notable player. I mean, you know, Dewan Harris had a career high 23. So good on KU to get the win, to come back, close on an 11 1 run in a game that had eight ties, 10 lead changes. Uh, but I did write about Kentucky because even in a loss, and I know Kentucky fans won't, you know, take a loss. And they, I, I led the column by saying, you know, Kentucky fans are not going to just accept a loss with a smile on their face. I get that. But it's undeniable. Like Kentucky looked fun as hell. It shot 38 three-pointers, which broke the record by five of of the most triple attempts in one game under Calipari. Only made 12 of them. By the way, Antonio Reeves took 17 of those threes. uh, Or 18 of them, 17 or 18 of them. Um, He only made three of them. But Rob Dillingham, I mean, he had a stretch in the first half, uh, which was outrageous, where he hit three after three after three. Reed Shepard looked good. Those two were well-composed. And... The fact that you didn't have like Kentucky didn't have the size, didn't have its, it didn't have big Z, didn't have big U or didn't have big A. You know, Aaron Bradshaw, the freshman five star, he's still hurt. You go to Onyeso is still hurt. And then Zivonimir Ivicevic is still not clear by the NCAA. So they didn't have the size down low, but it, it didn't matter in terms of Kentucky keeping it competitive, having a chance with less than a minute to go. Uh, Reeves had 24. I, I came away, you know, a do the had 16 and 13. I just, there's a lot of here, like some inconsistencies. Yes. Kentucky, is it going to blow a game or two this season because of its youth? Yes. Do I think it's actually going to steal a couple of games because of how much pizzazz is here and some promise? I I do. So I come away with this with some genuine optimism or at least relief that when we watch Kentucky this year, GP, it's not going to be, at least it shouldn't be We're early, but It shouldn't be a slog. I saw when you watch the way that even Wagner didn't play well, you watch the way this team wants to get up and down. Um, They're young. They don't know what they don't know, but there's a, there's enough there that I think, I think this team is going to be quite a thrill ride this season. It's like Cal was on a Kentucky message board, like scrolling through and he's like, Oh, some of you guys want, want Nate Oates to replace me. Watch this. Here's 38 threes for you. And he was into it. Too. I like you know that's modern but it's it's my it wasn't perfect but it's it's certainly more modern than it has been in recent years and like you said and I tweeted this last night as well hey, no moral victories this is a big blue nation as they say but when you are in a game with the number one team in the country in the final minute in the final seconds of the final minute and you're two projected or two of your projected first round picks 
Justin Edwards and DJ Wagner combined to go one of 18 from the field. I mean, I think you, you, I think you, how about that? You don't have to feel good about it, but I bet you, if you're a Kentucky fan, you wake up this morning and you go, all right, I saw some stuff that makes me think this might really be fun and really be successful. If it's possible for Kentucky to lose a game in the champions classic to another blue blood and feel good about itself or encouraged about itself. I think that's what happened last night. Yeah, I think so. I think so as well. Um, we'll see if it can continue. I, I just think it will. I mean, Dillingham, he can be a blur. Uh, and there were definitely times between Wagner and Dillingham uh, where, you know, they probably gave away five or six possessions. Shepard's poise is undeniable, at least at this point. Um, let me bring, actually, I meant to bring this up. Let me bring up uh, a friend of the show, Sam Vecini. Sam, we'll try and get you in here um, before the end of it. Sam tweeted last night. Uh, where was this tweet? He said, uh, hear me out. What if Reed Shepard is just Kentucky's best player straight up? Great shooter, unbelievable hands on defense, phenomenal basketball IQ. Love watching this dude. I agree. Love watching this dude. I don't know who Kentucky's best player is. Maybe it will be Reed Shepard, who was the lowest ranked of the five incoming freshmen, I believe, the five notable incoming freshmen. But uh, there is certainly, you know, uh, an, an element of composure that gets added to Kentucky when he is on the floor. Of course, he's the son of Jeff, she Jeff Shepard. Get ready to hear that every single game for the entirety of his career. But nonetheless, you know, local kid does good, brings real hope to Lexington and had a had a pretty terrific night overall. If anything, Dillingham's foul trouble kept him off the floor. I thought that was a, a major thing. But Shepard having 15 points, he went four or five from the field. You know, three of those were, were threes in addition to four steals. So, Wagner's going to play better. Edwards will certainly play better. Like it's eye opening that Edwards just was a no show. He just was. And you, we didn't expect that to be the case, but they've got enough guys who seem uh, eager and competent enough. And even like Trey Mitchell, I thought he did about as well as you could do against Dickinson. Like he didn't have a great game, but he had some nice, some nice moments in there as well. So for Kentucky being shorthanded, I mean, I thought they did well. Kentucky still hasn't had 10 or more turnovers in a game yet either. GP um, some good early signs. You don't want the loss, but you didn't get run out of the gym. I mean, you really you had the lead. Yes, you blew a lead. You're young, but some encouraging early signs. And we haven't talked about Kentucky in this kind of context many times over the past five or six seasons in the first week or two of the season. Um, yeah, some more losses are going to come. But again, uh, this team looks fun, and it's going to be worth watching, I think, way more often than not. Another thing Sam tweeted last night was about the NBA prospects You know that, that are going to be uh, presumably eligible for the 2024 NBA draft because we had some of them on display last night and I, I couldn't agree more with what he said, which is like, how many of these guys feel like actual lottery picks? Like it feels like whoever you think should be the number one pick in the next draft would be like the number five pick yeah. in a normal draft. It doesn't feel like there's a traditional like number one. It, that guy might emerge, but he, it doesn't feel like he's here yet. I, I, or I can't see him. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, I, I and listen, we'll see what what develops with this with this college class overall. Um, another projected number one pick didn't even get a get, get a win last night. We'll get into that later in the show. Out west, um, my last thought on this game was, um, and maybe it was just Kansas' size. And Kansas isn't overwhelmingly deep. Uh, you know, Bill Self coaches his team to another tremendous one. What do you want? Uh, like Dillingham, Shepard, Wagner, two and set like. It, it can play small, but sometimes like they they look small as well. So how they hold up to the rigors of a of a you know 35, 37, 38 game schedule remains to be seen. But uh I guess credit to Cal finally. He's got now you gotta get the wins. You know, you can be fun, but they're not gonna, you know, you can't you can't go, you know, three and ten against ranked competition this season. Not saying it will, but uh, but at least you had some gusto to you, and that was that was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, and I, I would add. Like, I don't know where this thing is going, although I, I would be more optimistic about Kentucky today than I was, say, this time yesterday. After Even after watching them lose, I would be more encouraged by what I saw. Um, but I, I do think it's, if you are a Kentucky fan who feels like, man, things have just gotten stale, you know, th th there's a Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame coach last night with a national championship and a million Final Four appearances who quite clearly has decided we're going to play a different way. Like, I, we're going to change the way we've been doing things. Um, and, and again, if you're looking for encouraging stuff from last night, 
uh, there was a lot of it from players, but I think that was from the coaching staff. That was that was on the list of things as well. On Reed Shepard, Pat Forty, of course, longtime columnist, longtime friend uh, from the great state of Kentucky or Commonwealth of Kentucky, whatever the proper way is to do that. He said, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 sort of as Reed Shepard was getting one bucket after another, like, you know, there were people who said this guy wouldn't play at Kentucky. Um, in fairness, like I might have been one of those people. I, I just it, it, certainly as a freshman, just I, I just assume somebody ranked 79th in a high school class is not going to be able to play for John Calipari at Kentucky as a freshman. If only because like somebody go look it up. I bet it it's either never happened or very rarely happened. Somebody ranked. Let's just let's draw a line 75th or lower in the high school class who was a real meaningful rotation player as a true freshman at Kentucky. I, I bet that list is either non-existent or short under John Calipari. And so I, I think it's reasonable to assume Reed Shepard might've had trouble getting on the court um, at Kentucky early. Um, and, you know, he, he did only play 16 minutes. So it's not like he went out and played 30 or something like that, but in those 16 minutes, undeniably, if you were watching it, he looked the part, he looked like he belonged. And it wasn't just because he was making shots. He looked like he belonged. A great night for Kansas because, yeah, they're the number one team with a win over Kentucky and 3-0, and and their you know, all-American caliber transfer just had a historically great game on a big stage. Bad night for the Hunter Dickinson is overrated crowd because he didn't look like that at all. Uh, so great night for Kansas, but I think also a good night for Kentucky. And, and uh, you know, now, you know, it, it – I saw even Kansas Kentucky fans last night tweeting in my mentions or somebody's mentions like, Hey, um, see you guys in April. So they're, 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 you know, there was some respect there. I'm sure disdain as well, but some <laughs> respect there after 40 minutes of basketball, let's move on to the first game. That was Duke and Michigan state. We talked about it. Duke needed a victory. We thought more than Michigan state needed a victory and they got it 74 65. We'll get into that next, but first a word from our partners. It's never too soon for college basketball. Don't miss the Baja Mar Hoops Bahamas Championship on CBS Sports Network. Final score, Duke 74, Michigan State 65. So Duke is 2-1 and one and Michigan State is 1-2. and two. Were you encouraged by Duke? Are you now discouraged by Michigan State? What's your main takeaways from, from the opening game of the Champions Classic? I'd lean more encouraged by Duke, which now holds a 15 to four all time edge over Sparty in this series. Um, the most random of notes, by the way, <laughs> go to go, uh, go quiz your friends today, folks. Duke is 10 and 0 all time on November 14th has never lost I knew on that. November 14th and it's placed legitimate that. opponents on that. So, so congrats to Duke on, uh, on its luckiest day on the calendar there. I know when I'm not, I know when I would never schedule them. John Shire picks up the phone and says, you want to do a home and home? We'll start it on November 14th. Yeah, no way, buddy. I'm not falling for that trick. No chance in hell. Coaches out there, beware. Um, I don't believe the Arizona game next year is on November Put it in your calendars. Put an alert on your calendars. Do not schedule under any You know, some people will state. put in, a, you know, you'll put it in your phone, like a do not answer. You ever do that? No. I haven't either, but I think I think people do do that. They go, don't answer this number, no matter what. That's what I would put. That's what I would put on my calendar. Don't schedule a game with Duke on November fourteenth, no matter what. Just a reminder. We all need reminders. Just keep it. Just just keep it in mind. That's all. That's all. That's all I'm all saying. Keep it in mind. Just keep it. I mean, in mind. ultimately, do what you want to do. I'm just saying, keep it in mind. Michigan State's one, uh, one and two for the first time since the sixteen seventeen season. Um, you know, the game wasn't that great to be honest, uh, but the and Filipowski played well, 15 points. He had, what, three assists, a block, and a steal. Mark Mitchell got 13. Caleb Foster is, is clearly uh, the biggest takeaway from this game. He really came on in the second second half and had his first emergence of the, of the season. Uh, he had 18 points, the most of any Blue Devil on the floor. He went seven of eight for shooting, and uh, seven of those, uh, four of those seven, made baskets were were three pointers. So Caleb Foster had himself a nice little coming out party. We get this almost every year. At least one of the players on one of the four teams that's a freshman will come into the Champions Classic and really just go off and and uh, make an announcement of, of their arrival. And for Tuesday night, that player was Duke's Caleb Foster, who is one of many talented, highly regarded freshmen on this team. But the late, least heralded, least regarded of the freshmen. Uh yeah, I guess so. I guess that is that, that is, was a theme from the Champions Classic. These yeah. talented freshmen 
who aren't the most talented or even close, yeah, according to the recruiting rankings, um, in their class, both played really well for, for yeah. Kentucky and and Duke. Yeah, I, I, but to juxtapose that, you're right in terms of rankings. I mean, Foster had been getting some decent buzz out of Durham in the buildup to the start of the season. So the fact that he was just a non-factor in the first few games for Duke was notable because thought some thought that he might be more of an impact player. And then finally he showed up and, and wound up doing it. Um, Tyson Walker had double figures again, uh, but uh, Duke's just the better team. And my last thought on this is uh, I think Michigan state will ultimately be okay. I do. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I talked my, as I think I mentioned this on either the, the, se the season Eve show or the big 10 show. Um, I talked myself more and more into Michigan State as the preseason kind of drew along there because, you know, Tom Izzo had never returned four seniors uh, who were starters. That had never happened on a Michigan State team, and he's got that this year. And and when I looked at everything they brought back, plus like a good team last year, not a great team, but a good team, I thought, well, like how, you know, I don't think this is a top five team, and I don't think Michigan State is going to be a top 10 team. But so I talked myself into picking them number 11 overall. and. You know, I, I try and resist some of that, you know, uh, frankly, like everyone else has got him here. So I try and resist that. But I in my heart of hearts, I, I, I was like, you know, Michigan State and, you know, the, the margins aren't that big. But I, I just did, I wasn't sure whether or not it was going to be a, a top 15 level team. And I'm still skeptical of that. It's easy to say after the loss here. Uh, and I think it'll be OK. But uh, sitting here on November 15th, seeing what it has and the three point shooting was a little bit better. But, you know, still, it's not quite there. I just wonder if Michigan State might wind up being, you know, fourth or fifth in the Big Ten and not the universally picked second best team in the Big Ten. So I do have some questions there. Um, uh, you know, uh, is, is Walker going to be the guy that's capable of carrying the team? I, I don't know. So um, Izzo should write it, but they got a, a tough schedule as well. So I should have trusted my initial instinct. That being said, congrats, Michigan State, on your uh, inevitable like seven and one run over the next eight games now that I've said that. On Caleb Foster, um, you know, that big performance uh, against Michigan State comes after he had zero points against Arizona. He was zero of zero from the field in 13 minutes, like didn't even take a shot. And this was a big uh, focus of John Shire's postgame press conference. He said what what that and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said what that young man has done over the past few days is, is it should be a, you know, every coach in America should share it with their freshmen. This guy. You know, um, you know, whether he was pissed, this is John talking, whether he's pissed at me or pissed at himself or just pissed at the game, like he was not happy with the way Friday night went for our team, for himself. And yet he just came into the gym. Nobody works harder. Nobody stays more focused. Nobody's more resilient. And he just keeps going on and on. And keep in mind, like Kyle Filipowski sitting right there. Um, there's another player right there. There's three player Duke players at the table, and John's just going on and on and on about Caleb. And he finally says, "Uh, like you know, you you look at that game on Friday night, and then like look at tonight. He won us the game. He won us the game. And like everybody just sort of and he, and then John notices like there's other players up here too. And he's like, oh, and these guys, these guys, these guys did too. And Filipowski's like, thanks, coach. <laughs> there was it's like a little funny moment uh, where you know they're just sitting there listening to John really rave about um you know one of the talented freshmen on duke's roster so that that's uh last night was a good night for duke we talked about it on the sunday night podcast you know it, it doesn't matter where this thing is going with duke if you start one and two after being ranked second in the preseason ap poll um with two losses as favorites you know people will start to you know, get their jokes off at the very least and maybe try to make serious points you know, even worse. And so to just avoid that as a quality of life thing. And, you know, sort of what I wrote about is if Duke would have dropped to one and two after being preseason top five, people would have started asking questions about John Shire. They would have. It wouldn't have been. It might not have been reasonable or fair, but it would have happened. Um, with this, though, you just don't, I don't think. I mean, you can be frustrated if you're a Michigan State fan. And, and you, you know, if you are you, uh, that leg, you can be skeptical that Michigan State is going to, you know, become what they were supposed to be, which is a national championship contender and the second best team in the Big Ten. But I think there's some statistical stuff that just, like, it's not going to last. 
Like they're shooting 16% from three. That's not going to last. AJ Hogard has missed 21 of his first 26 shots this season. He, he's five of 26 from the field in three games. Like that's not going to last. So I wouldn't be too alarmed if I'm Michigan State for, for those reasons. Some of the stuff that has led to this less than ideal start is just stuff that's not going to last. And then there's the track record. You know, as I mentioned in the column, John Shear doesn't have a track record really as a head coach, but Tom Izzo does. And one pattern throughout his long and Hall of Fame career is that he has multiple times got off to rough starts and ended up in a great place. Um, I just sort of scrolled through it last night. Started two and two in the 2002-2003 season. Still made the Elite Eight. Started 0-3 against top 50 Ken Palm teams in the 2004-2005 season. Still made the Final Four. Lost to Maryland early by 18 in the 2008-2009 season. Still made the title game of the NCAA tournament. Started 0-2 in 2011-2012. Still got a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. So is Michigan State really a top five team, top 10 team? Uh, I don't have them there anymore, obviously. But history tells us this team is going to be good, if only because without exception, regardless of the way Michigan State has ever started under Tom Izzo, they have at worst gotten good enough to be in the NCAA tournament and at best good enough to compete for the national championship. Uh, if you said it, I sorry, I blanked on it. Do you still have Michigan State ranked this morning? No, I'm just not going to punish you, drop you what it would have been more than 11 spots for losing a neutral court game to Duke by single digits. You know, if, I, if I'm if i calling Duke a top five team, I'm just not going to drop you. I, I would have James Madison ranked ahead of Michigan State at this point. They haven't lost. They won on Michigan State's floor. Michigan State has lost twice. That's It's all. too early to do that. Okay. It's too early to do stuff like that. I reason. I, I was going to say reasonable minds can disagree. I don't even know that I would say it's reasonable. Um, like I won't. Frank this I week, won't so. protest if somebody else wants to have James Madison over Michigan State on any ballot or in any rankings. But I, I think it. it I, I think it's too early to what I would consider to be an overreaction to one single forty-minute basketball game. I punish Michigan State obviously for losing to James Madison. But with teams, and this is something I've subscribed to for several years now, with teams that I think are supposed to be great, so based on where I have them ranked in the preseason, like top five, top ten, I'll, I'll give you leeway with one what loss mm -hmm. early in the season. I, I just do an automatic ten spot drop. You get a second questionable loss, well, now you got to go, unless you have the wins by then to offset it. But losing to Duke by single digits in Chicago is not a second questionable loss. It's a loss that um, was, frankly, expected. And so I did drop them, but not out. Michigan State's 17th at Torvik as of this morning. It's 33 at, Michigan's, uh, at Michigan at Ken Palm as of this morning. And over at Evan Maya, the Spartans sit at 34. So certainly a, a case that can be made that they should not be ranked. They will, I'll tell you, they will not be Michigan State. Uh, it's next game coming is at home against Butler, then home against Alcorn State. I won't say won't be. I, I will be surprised if a three and two Michigan State team will be ranked when the polls refresh next Monday. We'll wait and see on that. We've got other results to get to. And frankly, there are some ranked teams that are taking L's as is. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But first word from our partners. Huh. If I was in charge of the button, I'd push it. Push it's not it. my button. It's not my button either. Not are you there? He might. It's never too soon for college basketball. Don't miss the green light sunshine slam on CBS Sports Network. All right, that was stressful. I, I, I just, I, not, I, I, I gotta know you're there. I just, I, I'm worried for your health. <laughs> that was stressful. I was about to call 911. No. It's never too soon for college basketball. Don't miss the green light sunshine slam on CBS Sports Network. Somebody's getting trigger happy now. <laughs> Come on, let's I'll play this game. Give me another word from our partners. I want one more. Oh my god. I want another word from our partners. Show me our partners. Oh my. 
Oh my goodness. Let's, let's make it rain. That's amazing. Let's make it rain. Let's make this the biggest revenue producing podcast in CBS Sports history. Give me another word from our partners. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. Let's just take a little tour around. I got some news and notes. Nana, feel free to cut me off in the middle of this with, with a word from our partners. I, I will not be offended in the slightest. If <laughs> Okay. I was at the garden. That's the, that'll be the new thing. Every time we start to say something Nana doesn't approve of, we just go straight to our partners. <laughs> It's like, it's like cutting the mic. Cut the mic. Go to our Gosh. partners. Uh, Show me something man. about the Champions League, please. Needed it. Needed it. All right. I was in the garden Monday night. Took the trip down, hoping to see a good game. Did not. Michigan St. John's Patino's Garden debut. Uh, listed attendance was more than fourteen thousand. I don't know if it was that much, but it was. It they were. It was well attended for sure, and uh, plenty of hype. Michigan just made a laugher of it. They pulled away in the second half. It really, you know, down the stretch of the first half um, into the second half, it really wasn't in doubt. Namari Burnett started tremendously. It made his first eight shots. Doug McDaniel was unquestionably the star. And, you know, he, he's a little bit of a, of a water bug of a point guard, but man, oh man, does he have speed and his emergence could change. And I wrote a, I wrote a kind of a takeaways column off the game. Um, talked to Phil Martelli afterward about, the job he's done and and the emergence of of McDaniel and he had told me that you know he had a big maturation process over the course of the offseason both on the floor and off the floor and it's I mean it was it was clear to see um, if he's going to be that kind of player McDaniel and he's listed at 5'11 uh, that might be giving him an inch or two but for him to show up Show out. He hit a big three late. The game was already in hand, but he gave the uh, he put St. John's to sleep in that one. Um, Twenty six points, seven assists, six boards. Um, he was tremendous. Him and Burnett really made it happen. In fact, Olivia Kamwa was kind of uh, he was just like you know a role player at best. And I actually think the key thing for Michigan moving forward is for Kamwa to play like you know he's expected to be the team's best player. He wasn't there, uh, but a good win for Michigan, which has been. I tell you what, uh, right now with where we sit and keeping with the podcast theme, um, a lot of people could have been wrong on Michigan State and even more people wrong on Michigan. Michigan's three and zero has scored 89, 92 and 99 points in his first three games uh, against Asheville. That was a tournament team last year. It's got Drew Pember, who could start for any power five team in the country. Youngstown State, who's, you know, it's fine. Um, and then St. John's, uh, you know, it was a road game that goes down as a road game there. Michigan will have Long Beach State on Friday, and then uh, then they'll travel to Battle for Atlantis to get Memphis next week. We'll get to that down the road. As for St. John's, and then GP, I want your thoughts. Um, Patino was pretty uh, well measured afterward. Uh, he did say uh, the one kind of quote um, that he said in classic Patino fashion was uh, an earmuffs here for the for the little ones. I guess he said our offense shocked the shit out of me, and, and by him saying that, he was meaning. I knew we were going to have problems with our defense early. And I had mentioned that on the show previously a couple of times, but he expected them to be able to respond to Michigan's tempo and offensive flair in a way, in a way that it just, it just flat out didn't. Um, it was, and the game was 89, 73. I mean, Michigan got up by 25, 26 at one point there. Um, Joel Soriano was just okay. Dennis Jenkins, eh, Chris Ludlam, eh, you know, just, just not a lot there. So, We'll wait and see. It was certainly a damper on uh, on the hype around St. John's because it wasn't competitive. Um, I certainly would have loved to have driven into the city to see a competitive game. What were your thoughts on uh, you know the, the the Johnny's no show after you know seven months of anticipation leading up to that moment? Well, it, it, I could be a little more forgiving about the no show because like you know bad games happen, but there had been a a, a series of like things coming out that suggested, Oh, maybe we got a little caught up in this Rick Patino thing in year one. Um, they didn't play well in the preseason. Even Rick had suggested, you know, we got a ways to go. And then in their first big game under Rick, I mean, they got beat by a team that people aren't sure is going to make the NCAA tournament. Now I agree with you that Michigan looks better than, any of us assumed Michigan would be, um, at least so far. But still, that's not – when you get run off of your home floor by an unranked team, that that starts to 
maybe make it look like the people who would have bet St. John's is an NIT team more than an NCAA tournament team. Mm-hmm. They, they, they might, they might be onto something. Yeah. Well, uh, well, wait. Not, I'm not trying to change my prediction mm-hmm. nine days into the season, but that was not a, I didn't see much from St. John's that that was encouraging. Yeah. I think Patino and his staff are now kind of bracing for uh, some growing pains and some, eh, it's going to be bumpy. It might be bumpy the whole season. They might, you know, they could put themselves together and build a resume, but we'll see. Wasn't a, uh, wasn't a gr- good first, uh, for showing uh, and it even, wasn't it wasn't um just a transition here real quick yeah. uh a good monday night for the big Correct. east yes. uh, xavier lost to purdue no shame there uh, it, it, i assume everybody that plays at mackey is going to lose there this season um but villanova lost to Penn, 76 72 and i just started going through the numbers mm-hmm. let's keep the most basic one let's put it up first Cal Neptune is now 19 and 18 as Villanova's head coach with losses to Temple, Portland, and Penn. You concerned? Uh, you lose to Penn um, I, I, in the context of this season. I think it's it's understandable to be concerned. Now, the, the, the it's not funny, but the interesting thing about this is uh, Martelli in the post-game press conference on Monday night. So he's sitting there and he got asked about winning over St. John's and doing it at the Garden and his big return to the Garden. And then I sent it out um, where he said, you know, you're going to get pissed, but uh, it's the second best arena in America. Of course, as you all know, the best uh, uh, building for basketball in this country is the Palestra. Of course, Bill Martelli, longtime coach at St. Joe's, a bona fide Don in that basketball loving city is going to stand up for the Palestra. And as all this was happening, like, Penn Villanova, and he didn't know it. Like Penn Villanova was unfolding at the Palestra. Lo and behold, I told him a couple minutes later after the press conference, say, "Hey, by the way, Penn just beat Villanova uh, at the Palestra." And he goes, "What I tell you? The best building in the country, and some more Palestra magic there." Um, which good on Penn. Um, a shout out to Coach Steve Donahue, who I know is listening to this episode because he is one of uh, the many dedicated listeners to the show. So uh, good on, on the Quakers for getting uh, a win. That obviously means a ton for the program, but also, you know, this is big five hoops and that still means a ton in that city. And so we're going to focus on Nova because it's the biggest program and it's going through an interesting time here with Neptune, but um, to get this kind of win and, and, and Jay lost a big five game. I think to Penn as well. Yeah, he did just a few years, right before, years, right? a couple of years before he retired. Okay, I, I thought I remembered that happening. So yeah, again, this is kind of speaks to the magic of that of of that of college basketball in that city overall. But yeah, there's there's reason for some for some concern uh, if you're Villanova. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's a five alarm fire. Penn shot 59 percent in the second half. I didn't see any of the game because I was I was there obviously at the Garden. Um, but Nova slumping, and now it, it welcomes in like slumping Maryland on Friday. Uh, it, that game now carries a ton of urgency for both teams. I will point out, I didn't realize this. I wonder if folks found you as well. Uh, our good buddy Kermit Ro- Roosevelt the Third, podcast mini legend. He works at Penn apparently. So the podcast Juju, the podcast Karma was on Penn's side from the get go. Kermit Roosevelt the Third works at Penn. If you're unfamiliar with the story, I can't even get into it. I, I, I. I won't. I refuse to, but I at least want to give him a mention as well. Um, I want to echo what you said. Happy for Steve Donahue. Uh, love him. Great man. Great coach. Happy for him, his players, for that program. I do not want to take anything away um, from that amazing night that they experienced. Like, there's no way to to say things like, are you concerned about Villanova without taking away from Penn's accomplishment? Um, so I don't want to do that. I realize the way it comes across, but that's a, that's a memory. Those guys will have forever like that. You know, maybe if you ain't in that city, you don't properly understand what that means, but uh, for Penn to beat Villanova at the Palestra and a big, that's a, that's a big time night. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll remember that forever. So I'm, I'm thrilled for them, but it is troubling, you know, period, new paragraph for, for, for Villanova. As I mentioned in the lead to the top 25 and one on Tuesday morning, it, this is not like Kenny Payne at Louisville situation. Like one situation is way dramatically worse than the other. Um, one situation I can't imagine is going to get to year three. Uh, Cal Neptune, it is still totally reasonable to me for somebody to go, 
to go, well, yeah, we're going to look up in a few years and say, hey, we got off to an uneven start, but he settled into the job. I- I'm not ruling that out. But he is 19 and 18 as Villanova's head coach. Started 16th last season in the AP poll. Missed the NCAA tournament. Started 19th at Ken Palm last season. Finished 51st. Yeah, injuries, all sorts of stuff, but that's disappointing. There's no getting around it. This season, you start 22nd in the AP poll, and you lose your third game of the season to Penn, which is ranked 172nd at Ken Palm. Um, So with that in mind, I went and looked this up. I don't know if you saw the tweet, but this would be concerning to me if I were a Villanova fan because this should not happen. Jay Wright's final 321 games as Villanova's coach. How many times do you think he lost to a sub-100 Ken Palm team in his final 321 games? What's 321? Is that just... Uh, it's, that I cut it off. Right? It's are, you, are you literally went back to... Is it like this? The cutoff like they're just in the middle of a random season? Or? Yeah, because they lost to one and I started right after that. Okay, got it. Um, how many times did they lose sub... So 100 or what? So there's 321 games. The final 321 games of Jay Wright's coaching career at Villanova... How many times did he lose to a sub-100 Ken Palm team? I'll say two. Two is the correct answer. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> That's nice. a trivia time win for you. I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> that was... Okay. All right. So I Jay Wright was... lost to sub-100 Ken Palm teams twice, two times, in his final 321 games as Villanova's coach. As noted, Cal Neptune has now coached 37 games mm-hmm. as Villanova's coach. How many times do you think he's lost to sub-100 Kim Palm teams? I will say... That's an, I'll say... I'll say four. Five. Say, uh, it's more than... I was like, I don't know if it's double. It's oh, Wow, okay. Five and 37, two and 321. Yeah. One of those is different than the other. I mean, I guess yeah. they're both different from each other. They, that's true. But that's, you get the point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. Jay was actually on hand, too. Uh at this game, I believe. Um, we'll see. I, 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 it's not time. I, I listen. The hardcore fans, I understand. Like you, you take a loss like this, and you're like, it's time to pull the ripcord. It's not time yet, but no. I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting it's not, that. It's not. It's I'm not. not. It's, it's clear. I'm just saying these numbers aren't pretty. I know. It's not easy to follow the walk and follow legend, but we'll see. I still like the roster a ton, actually. He'll self follow the legend. That seems to be working out. Kansas might truly be the one exception to the rule, but yes, and at least in college basketball. Um, but we'll we'll see. Um, it, it's just not going as well as it is, say, at you know Duke to pick another spot where someone followed a legend. But Maryland at home, and then you get uh, you get battle for Atlantis next week for Villanova. So we'll we'll get to the Wildcats again in short order on the podcast. Uh, elsewhere. The best game of Tuesday night was probably Kansas, Kentucky, but I don't know. Marquette, Illinois, man, that was that was an awesome one. How about this? Best game, Kansas, Kentucky, biggest win, Marquette at Illinois. Probably true, but also I that game had the on-campus environment. I got to get to that building at some point. I've I've never been to State Farm Arena. That uh, I've been. It, it always shows up well, uh, and it looked it looked great. GP, um, I am. Uh, I think I'm going to endorse. Um, if you'll allow it, the, the conspiracy theory, um, Tyler Kolick was never injured. I don't think this was the case whatsoever. I think that Marquette clearly tried to dupe the entire country. Kolick played, <laughs> what, 37 minutes, had 23 points, six boards, four assists. He did not look injured whatsoever. Guided this team on the road against a good Illinois team with a, a great back and forth, Tyler Kolick. Never was injured, incapable of injury. You with me? I would like to be. It would it would be fun to start assuming Tyler Kolick is a superhero. Wouldn't that be Wouldn't that be a wild story? He was a game t- he was a game time decision, and then the next thing you know, it's like this. It just never happened. Super impressive. Congrats to Kolick. Um, yeah, just, after where Brad Underwood said, "Did you see his ankle?" He was talking to the reporters. He said, did you see his ankle? It was black and blue, and he I played see. 37 minutes. Uh, uh, okay, so you're, what you're telling me is Brad Underwood is in on the conspiracy. That, yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you took that as um, me trying to discredit your conspiracy, that's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to show you Underwood's in on it, too. 
Underwood's in on it too. <laughs> They're all in on it. They're all in on it. Oh man. Um, and then uh, Shaka Smart also clearly in on it. And you know, Shock, he's been trying to pull these types of things for decades. Who win it now? <laughs> you know, Shock is always trying to get over on you. He's been doing this for decades. Um, no, Shaka said, listen, our, our I didn't think he was gonna play. Our trainers told me he's not gonna be able to play, but Tyler never said that. And so here he is. That's right. He went up to, uh Shaka went up to the trainers before. The game, they're like, we don't know if he's going to play. And his response was, no, I just, he got I out mean, there. He dominated. Cam Jones. This new game. JFK podcast out there. I keep seeing people tweet about Soledad O'Brien and Rob Reiner. They're going to finally figure out who killed, who assassinated John F. Kennedy. Yep. Don't, hey, forget that everybody's tried this for like 60 years. We gonna get it done in a podcast now. Get it, give it a crack. I I already listened and, to episode and, one. What are you talking about? Find out the mystery behind Tyler Kolick's ankle injury. That's what I'm saying. Season two of Who Killed JFK will actually be called Tyler Kolick never had an ankle problem. What went down on Friday, November 10th? It was Friday, November 10th. Tyler Kolick landed at Love Field a little after 11 a.m. against the Ryder Bronx. <laughs> There Brad Underwood two. standing behind the picket fence. <laughs> remember when you stepped on that homeless man? That. There are two infamous dates in American history. November 22nd, 1963. And then almost 60 years later, November 10th, 2023. The ankle injury that never was. Yeah. Congrats yeah. to Marquette on a big win. Oso Igadaro had 13-8. By the way, Terrence Shannon Jr. was great again. 21 points. Marcus Domask. He had a season high 18 for Illinois. Luke Goody had a career high 13. Marquette has won five in a row against ranked teams for the first time in program history. And it's doing this while it is ranked fourth in the country, its highest ranking since 77, 78. That's good time stuff. Before we continue, I mean, it sounds impressive, but they got a superhero playing point guard. Before we continue, where do you have Marquette ranked as of this morning? And where do you have Illinois? I have Marquette at six. And and Illinois, I just kept them right where they were, and where they were was twenty two. Okay, not going to punish you for losing to a team the caliber of Marquette, particularly when they have a superhero at point guard and Cam Jones at shooting guard. National title contender, folks, get ready for it. Um, all right, let's tour around quickly with a few other results here. Uh, we've had some power conference teams taking some home L's and buy game situations. USC lost 70 to 60 on Tuesday night. It was a late one out in LA. And they were shorthanded. I'm, I'm getting there. Okay, okay. No Boogie Ellis, uh, who had had an ankle, I think. And then Kobe Johnson didn't play for reasons that were not disclosed. That's two of the three best players. Isaiah Collier did play. I, I want to, let me stop you for a second. What if part of this conspiracy... Mm. What if they took Tyler Kolick's ankle, put it on Boogie Ellis, <sighs> gave Boogie Ellis' his ankle to Tyler Kolick, and that, more than anything else, will forever explain November 14, 2023? It deepens. I got a, you don't I got a direct message, Soledad O'Brien. You aren't ready to take the trip. I have to direct, excuse <laughs> me, I have to direct message Soledad O'Brien. We're going to get on this. Justin Hone had 25 points a game high for the Anteaters. Uh, they, were, they were ahead the whole way. I had Irvine, 76 in my top 101. If you followed in the preseason, you're not stunned that this is a good team. However, it is genuinely shocking that USC, even shorthanded, got beat uh, decidedly and by double digits at home. Trojans making me look bad. I had, if I'm going to boast on where I had Irvine, I've also, I got to admit, I had USC 10th overall heading into the season. That's a little concerning, but didn't have two of the three best players. That's obviously a factor. Have to believe if they were on the floor, they probably would have won. Um, I mentioned earlier, Kevin McCullough had a triple double Trey Alexander almost had one. Uh, Creighton beat Iowa late. Uh, Alexander had 23 points, 11 boards, nine assists. So good on him. Creighton was expected to win. It got the win. If you've been following along on YouTube in the chat, then yes, obviously we were going to get to this next point. It's time to give some big ups to the alma mater of Elvis Presley. UMass Lowell goes down to Atlanta and gets its second win ever, 
Trivia time. Okay. UMass Lowell has two wins over ACC opponents. The second one came on Tuesday night against Georgia Tech. Who was the first? Boston College. That is correct, my <laughs> friend. And that's the easiest trivia time ever. And that I swear to God, I didn't Boston know it. College. I didn't know it. I just knew it. <laughs> UMass Lowell has only been Division I since the year 2013. It won on Tuesday night, 74-71 over the Bees. I, I know UMass Lowell got like an $85,000 check to go beat Boston College one night. <laughs> Maybe at least, if not more, it, uh, it, uh, yes, it beat BC December 6th, 2015 by two points on the road to so two all time ACC wins for bat Pat Duquette's Mississippi river Hawks, Elvis Presley smiling down from above. Mm -hmm. That's the first time this program, again, it's only been around for a decade has never started three and zero in a season. It's done it here. I, I was thinking as this happened about the guy who emailed the show over the summer, and allegedly connected with this woman who also <laughs> listens to the show, and they bonded over the fact that UMass is Elvis's alma mater. Do you remember that, yes. <laughs> that mailbag episode? I, that guy, I forget his name. I'm sure he's listening. I hope this woman who allegedly exists, by the way, never got a follow-up email. Shouts to CBS at gmail.com. We would like confirmation that this encounter actually happened. We would not like to, you know, put forth fabrications on the show. Re regardless, this gent did send the email. He was on my mind in addition to... Elvis, I'm assuming I haven't checked your top 25 and one this morning, GP, but I'm assuming this kind of win means um, if you still refuse to rank the Dukes of James Madison, then surely you got to have the Riverhawks somewhere in that top 25 and one Mississippi Riverhawks. If, if I'm if I were if I were expanding the top 25 and one to type top 25 and three, mm. I would have a, it'd be a 27 James Madison and 28 Mississippi Riverhawks. They're right there. I mean, they're right there. And there's so many connections. They beat Georgia Tech, coached by Damon Stoudemire. Damon Stoudemire, of course, coached in Memphis, both for the Tigers and the Grizzlies. Yes. He's very familiar with the history of Elvis. In fact, it's one of the reasons he scheduled this game. His time in Memphis. Yeah. He wanted I to bring was, Elvis's I, alma mater I, to yeah. Atlanta. He's also a huge Elvis fan. Yes. Yes. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Huge. Yeah. Huge. It's uh, it's just really, you know, glad the King got to have a, this November 14th, 2023, man. A lot of stuff went on. It's a big, it's just a, it's a big time day there. Um, we would almost be talking about another power conference team losing at home, but Syracuse rallied from 24 down to avoid a third straight home loss to Colgate per Mike Waters. Does a great job covering that team. It's the biggest comeback win for Syracuse since 1998 and uh, per the ACC second biggest ever by an ACC team just last season we talked about in the pod FSU came back from losing by 25 to beat Miami um, elsewhere on Tuesday Providence manhandled Wisconsin 72 59 the game was not that close it was it was over in the first five minutes Kim English gets the first big win of his career uh, Wisconsin ugh, I mean Buddy, I mean that one's that that it ain't been a first good Nine days for them. It has not. I mean, it opened up uh, a can of whoop ass on Arkansas State and dropped 105, and then since then lost ages 70 at home to Tennessee, and then it was not competitive against uh, Providence whatsoever. Uh, it gets to kind of get good this Friday at home against Robert Morris, and then it's got Virginia on a neutral next week on Monday in the Fort Myers. We'll get to that on the uh, on the Sunday show. Elsewhere, uh, not a result, but a, uh, but a no elsewhere in the Ocean State. Uh, this was inevitable. Uh, Jared Grasso resigned at Bryant. He was put on mandatory leave about seven weeks or so ago. He announced it on Twitter. Um, this had been a done deal for a number of weeks. It was just a matter of when this was going to come out. So Jared Grasso, who did take Bryant to the NCAA tournament, but uh, but was being uh, internally investigated by the school. Those details have still not emerged. He is now out. Phil Martelli Jr. Yes, um, plenty of Martelli content on this, this episode here. Um, Right now, uh, Phil Martelli Jr. is technically interim head coach, and his father is uh, is on a temporary basis doing the same thing at Michigan. So, kind of a the circumstances are absolutely terrible, but it's kind of kind of interesting that the both both Martellis are currently coaching um, in temporary instances. But Phil Martelli Jr. will have a chance, and I actually think that he will be promoted and be the head coach permanently for Bryant moving forward. Um, and that's, I guess, the past couple of days. Real quick, heads up on the next two GP uh, Wednesday here tonight. 
pretty rough. Uh, you've got the Gavit games continuing. Georgetown Rutgers uh, for the sicko factor, I guess. And then Princeton Duquesne. We talked about Duquesne on the Sunday show. Those are the only ones barely worth watching. Princeton Duquesne actually, you know, that's not those. Both those teams could be in the NCAA tournament. They can both be like that's that's genuinely like that's. Listen, I love the sport. I'm going to watch it. We're trying to give a heads up on our viewers and listeners on what you might. Wednesday's tough. I mean, Tuesday was good. Frankly, if and I don't know why this has to happen, but like if you had just simply put Marquette, Illinois tonight, you know, like you would have probably had people that covered the games in Chicago at Champions. They stay one more day. They'd make the drive down to Champaign. You get even a bonus coverage. I, I've whatever. never understood why more people don't think that way, like especially when we had ACC Big Ten Challenge every year. And we've talked about this before. Um, I would have. Duke and Carolina hosting every year um, on op- on different nights. So like Duke host on Tuesday and North Carolina host on Wednesday. And then, and then every year I would, uh, and then in the opposite years, I would have Michigan and Michigan state hosting same year. So that's on different nights so that whatever national media you get, they're going to be in your buildings, two straight nights. P- people don't schedule with that kind of stuff in mind. They should, they should just, you know, a little, little bonus exposure. Marquette, Illinois was a really, really good game, and it got some run. We talked about it on the show, but it didn't lead the show. If it was on Wednesday, it it would uh, it would have been more prominently featured across multiple platforms with entities that cover the sport nationally. Thursday, Feast Week gets going, although just barely. Charleston Classic. So you got St. John's. Again, here's the four matchups. St. John's, North Texas. That's actually... <laughs> that's really intriguing because North Texas, Ross Hodge, first-year coach, but defensive mastermind. Uh, what do you got, Johnny's, in that one? Dayton, LSU. Uh, Houston, Towson. And then Utah Wake Forest. We'll see how the bracket breaks. Houston will be expected to win that event. We'll see if it winds up happening. Also on Thursday, Missouri, which just got beat at home, now goes to Minnesota. Potentially a slippery one for Mizzou. We'll see. Dawson Garcia was one of the best players in the Big Ten in the first week of the season. We'll see if Minnesota, you know, it's in need of like a really morale boosting win for that program under Ben Johnson. And I'll also note on the note where like Princeton Duquesne's like a good Wednesday game, but there's another top. 100 Kempom mid-major matchup on Thursday. Furman plays Liberty. Two other teams that could wind up being in the field of 68 in 2024. So keep an eye on that. Kind of slow over the next two days. But then once we get to Friday and into the weekend, we're going to really pick up and we'll have plenty to talk about on the Friday show. Oh, I can't wait. Buddy, I can't wait for Friday show. I can't wait for the next word from our partners. Oh, man. Can we get one more? Nada, can we get one more? You can Let's literally you Let's can interrupt rich. us in the middle of this, Nada. Are you there? Let's one get more. rich. A guy's, a guy's computer completely glitches out, and I'm never going to hear the end of this. Let's get it. rich. Let's go. Let's, let's, let's get rich. Nada, right now. Another word. Just no, do no, it. One no, more no, word. No, I'm good. I'm good. We can go oh, home man. now. Man, buddy, I, think about the email we would get. Guys, you made us $70 million with all those words from your partners. <laughs> Oh man! Hey, maybe next time. I know that's maybe a good moment. I lo- those are the best moments on the show. So. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. and Teagle, Legend Hut Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening and watching. I on College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. More of us than there are of them. That needs to be reflected in the comments. So make sure you're doing that, and uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. Till then. Take care.